Hello again, everybody. I'm Rick Chrisman, Interim Senior Minister at Elliott Church of Newton, along with Dr. Elizabeth Windsor, our Associate for Christian Education. Hi, Elizabeth. Hi, Rick. We are in our second installment of this experience, um, of uh, which we're trying to uh, interest all of you in and in reading The Some of Us by Heather McGee. Uh, in our last installment, um, and these are very short. We just do 10 to 15 minutes in the hopes that um, uh, it will enlighten you um, of somebody's very interesting thesis, but also possibly induce you to get the book. So last time, Elizabeth, we talked about how racism drained the pool. That's the title of her, mm -hmm. uh, that previous chapter. And um, this week we're looking at going without now i i don't mean to spring this on you but i'm trying to understand what the title of the chapter has reference to going without um i think her reference there is that um we have consciously or unconsciously created a system that um pits um people of color against white people that zero sum game that she talked about in chapter one and she is looking at um public education public housing and public um health care in this particular chapter and her thesis is basically that if we were going to, as a government of the people, we were going to make those things available to everybody, including the people at the bottom of the pyramid, uh, then we would rather go without it. Much like, you know, if we have to share the public swimming pools, we're just going to close the swimming pools. We're not going to share. We, we don't we, want to uh, yep. make these resources or uh, supports available to people of color in particular. Mm -hmm. And therefore we don't have them either. So the title Going Without has reference as much to um, white folks um, who vote against uh, these um, support systems to prevent people of color from getting them, but it, it makes them go without them as well. Exactly. Um, and she does a wonderful job of looking at this through, um, you know, the healthcare situation in rural America, where hospitals are closing, and the resources for um, good, affordable healthcare doesn't exist. Um, you know, Texas wound up closing many of its public hospitals because they would not um, take the Medicaid, the Medicaid expansion through the Obama health program. Free money, free money, so, and they didn't take it. Yeah, because it might benefit people who were in the country illegally as far as they were concerned, or black people or other immigrants. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the places, the, the former Confederate states, um, are across the board recipients of more federal aid than the blue states. The blue states um, provide more tax revenue that gets shared with Kentucky and Mississippi and Texas. So the people who are, you know, seeing the zero sum game in these former Confederate states are harming themselves as long as it will harm or protect the, someone, protect them for somebody getting something that they think should be theirs. Well, since you bring up the, the healthcare issue, that was a very interesting education she gave us um, about the uh, origins of universal health care mm -hmm. debate in the government going back to uh, was it um, was that Truman's uh, administration? Yes. Senator Claude yep. Pepper. She told the mm -hmm. story about his efforts to 
um, to get universal health care um, adopted as a, as a national policy. Uh, what I found most interesting was the fact that apparently the debate was going along um, as you expect political debates to do until um, the opposition to this became aware of the fact that Senator Pepper um, had made the acquaintance of Paul Robeson, an African-American uh, figure mm -hmm. at that time, of course, was very well known for his, his musical artistry, um, but uh, also because as a black man, uh, he felt that Russia was more hospitable to his and his to his people and his people's needs than the U.S. was. Well, that association um, was enough, I guess, on two scores: a man of color and also, you know, with socialist. Um, what do you want to say? Not affiliation, but certain leanings. Leaning uh, uh, that between the two of those issues, uh, his reputation or his uh, his cause. Um, universal health care was uh, undermined. Did, do I remember that all correctly? Mm -hmm. Yes. And uh, then it, it wasn't until the Clintons were in office or Bill Clinton was president and Hillary Clinton uh, opened up this, you know, office in the White House um, to uh, study the subject again. Uh, and then we come down to um, Obama and his effort, which of course uh, was surprising that he got, got it across because he himself as a person of color, a black man, um, would represent the very constituency that they would not want to help. Of course, there was no Republican support, whatever, zero uh, in the House and Senate uh, for this bill, uh, notwithstanding tremendous efforts uh, to get that, get that across. Uh, get that across the line. So what else about uh, the health care? Um, the, um, the current situation for health care is that uh, it's being attacked regularly and attempts are being made to undermine it at the court level to call it unconstitutional mm -hmm. um, and thereby accomplish what you're talking about, which is uh, having everybody go without um but i don't know how anyone can disagree with the the desire to detach health care from employment um because well not just because you might not be employed or you might be retired um but you might change jobs and um all of these variables are really obnoxious um mm -hmm. well in the whole pre-existing yeah. conditions right. you know not having to be covered and you know, not being able to keep your kid on your insurance policy until they're 26. Um, you know, it's very detrimental to what we see as the middle class, the way the middle class works. Mm -hmm. You know, your, your kids go to college. Um, you, and she talks about this in this chapter. She starts with public education. Right. Um, you know, you send your kids off to college as a middle class person who has some family wealth behind them and you somehow get your child through college and then they go to graduate school and they're not working. So how do you get them insurance? They need they need to be on your homeowner's policy or your insurance policy. And at the same time, with the cost of 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 post-secondary education, including public universities and colleges, becoming more and more expensive. Everybody graduates with some amount of debt, but it's much, much worse for black families and other families of colors who don't have the uh, inherited generational wealth. And so there again, you know, we would rather not fund public colleges and universities because black people might get out of debt. Right, well, and uh, overlooking the fact that uh, they might, the white people might get out of debt themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, 
And this, uh, I, one of the things that surprised me under the category of something I didn't know before um, was that uh, student de debts have been so big and take so long to pay off for some people that you can go into your retirement years with, with a portion. Mm -hmm. Now, when I was in graduate school and took out um, loans under the NDEA, National Defense and Education Act, uh, it was a 3% loan and had to be paid back in 10 years, um, which was not a terrific hardship. Uh, the interest rate was so low. Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, at that time, the cost of education was much lower. My tuition didn't require me to, you know, mm -hmm. uh, to augment my work uh, income uh, that much. So uh, I was done in 10 years. Uh, that's not generally the case now uh, where, where young people um, and, and practically cannot uh, get married and, and, mm -hmm. and consider buying a, a house of any kind um, under those circumstances. Yeah, I was, that made me think, um, I finished my master's degree in 1997. Um, I, I had borrowed money. I paid my loan off the, in 2009, which was the year that my eldest son went to college. So, I, you know, and I never would have gotten my doctorate no. had not the church where I was working paid for it. Really? Yes. You mean yes. through your, your income there? You were... No, they, they sent me one, you know, one day the, the senior minister I was working for, who had known me for a, a quite a while, sat me down into his office and said, so when are you going to do your doctor work? Oh. And I said, I have a kid going to college next year. I'm not doing my doctoral work. And he said, yes, you are. Go apply. We'll pay for it. Oh, wow. What a so, story. Yeah. So I, I spent $500 on my books. That's what my, my doctoral degree cost me. But okay. I would not have gone mm -hmm. on, uh, otherwise. Well, listen, um, we're going to be out of time here pretty soon. We don't want to fail to observe that um, Heather McGee's book is a is a um, perfect instance of the critical race theory literature that's been coming out for mm -hmm. a while at such a time now, and which is giving people on Fox News fits um, because um, they're saying that it uh, this theory uh, is increasing the divisiveness in the country, mm -hmm. um, which, of course, it, it is not the case. It's trying to get everybody on an equal, equal footing. Um, in fact, uh, you had read uh, Kendi. How how does his name go? The against Ibram Kendi. Ibram the... Kendi. Uh, how to be an anti-racist book. Mm -hmm. Um, all of which uh, are intended to show the ways. Now, you put it well before uh, a moment ago when you said um, it directs us to think about systemic and structural sources of these uh, inequities. Uh, and and you, you don't need to focus on your own feelings about whether, you know, the, mm -hmm. what, how you feel about people of color or or not is irrelevant. Uh, you can you can be a, a progressive white liberal and and uh, and not and not get to the the bottom of the racism um, mm -hmm. in your own life because we all we're all floating on it. It's our flotation device. But it's not about um, and Kendi has been very active in this conversation around critical race theory because he does not believe that racism is a concrete. Um, identity for a person. You know, you on the one hand can hold views, you know, you can think in your head uh, the stereotype of, you know, well, Black people are lazy. But on the other hand, you can be acting to make sure that public housing and public education, all of that are positive ways of 
engaging. Nobody is explicitly anti-racist or explicitly racist. Mm -hmm. That it is not an identity. It's a, a condition that sort of ebbs and flows through your life and in situations. Mm -hmm. And the point of critical race theory is not that everyone is personally a racist. It's that the systems and the structures that we have built up and uh, Heather McGee illustrates these quite clearly with the way um, public education and public housing and public um, health benefits are structures. Mm -hmm. They and they're things that we can change mm -hmm. without everybody having to go to diversity training. Well, and theoretically, that should should lower the resistance on the part of whites because they don't have to feel so defended or defensive at a mm -hmm. personal level. Uh, as you said, what what you feel is irrelevant, um, uh, but it it frees you to focus on on changes that um, have very widespread. Um, uh, implications for improvement. Well, listen, we have run out of time. Any last well, thoughts? Yes, I I want to um, be sure we make the point that the end of this chapter, chapter three, is where she begins to talk about the solidarity dividend mm -hmm. and how things, um, you know, ways in which we can be allies with each other. Um, and she talks about um, a, a Minnesota um, organizer who brought Muslim and white communities together and did things like having potlucks and shoveling each other's driveways in the snow and knocking on doors and talking to neighbors about the things everybody needed and valued. Mm -hmm. And out of that, um, she, this community of different races, and in this case is ethnicity and religion, began to make together a public investment in their community. And that's what she calls the solidarity dividend. Um, and she points out the last sentence of this chapter, as we become a nation with no racial majority, we will need more of this spirit to create a new basis for investing in ourselves broadly and without prejudice. And I think that's very hopeful. It is very hopeful. And it's a great turn of phrase, solidarity dividend. Um, mm -hmm. Because, you know, all of these um, government and corporate in, uh, expenditures for the social fabric of our society are investments. Uh, they should be thought of as investments, not expenses. Mm -hmm. uh, that changes your whole outlook because investments result in dividends that everybody, uh, everybody can share. Mm -hmm. Well, listen, um, we'll pick up the next chapter, which is called Ignoring the Canary. You can sort of guess what that image is about anyway. And it's all about the housing bubble that occurred and the roots of that, that she traces mm -hmm. back to pre-Civil War times. So that's a very interesting um, uh, learning that, that comes from that. Well, nice chatting with you, Elizabeth. Always fun. Yeah. We'll pick it up again next time. And I hope we'll see all of you here. So and bye. be sure to send us questions or oh, things you'd me. like to talk more about. Right. We'd be happy to have further discussions. Keep those cards and letters coming. You can write, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll offer my email address, which is reverick at elliotchurch.org. And what is yours, Elizabeth? Dr. Elizabeth at elliotchurch.org. There you go. <laughs> Otherwise, uh, come back to the website homepage again. All right. Bye for now. Blessings all. Bye.